Hey guys, Pastor Adam here and welcome to our online campus here at Abbas House. We're so glad that you're joining us. Now, 2020 has been a rough year, right? It's been really hard on a lot of people. Some of you have lost loved ones. You've lost your jobs. Some of you have even lost connection with friends and family. It's a tough time, right? But this is the perfect time for us to dive into God's Word and look at the Old Testament at a guy named Job. Pastor Ronnie is going to unpack some truths that come from the life of Job, who, who had everything. I mean, this guy had it all together. He had everything, and then he lost everything, including his health. But we're going to find out how Job continued to hold on to the one true God. He continued to trust in God and he came out the other side. Now, if you watch the entire service today, Pastor Ronnie is going to help you figure out how you will survive these storms just like Job did. So stay tuned, stay alert, stay focused and absorb the word of God today along with Pastor Ronnie. It's going to be an amazing time. Now, worship Worship is going to be fire today. We got uh, Samantha Stein, we got Jay Craig, we've got Angie McGregor leading worship. And you know that anytime those three are on stage, it is going to be lit. Now, listen, guys, like always, we want you to participate with us. So join in, worship, sing along, get your praise on, right? Now, for our online audience, Check it out, guys. We've got pastors on hand for you. If you need anything, just let us know you're there. If you're new, hit the new here button. If you need prayer, hit the request prayer button and you will have a private chat with a pastor and we will pray with you. Guys, it's that time. Let's get our worship on. Let's join the Hickson campus together. We love you. We are so glad you're here with us. Here we go, guys. Come on, let's stand and worship. Fullness of eternal promise. Stirring in your sons and daughters. Earth revealing heaven's wonders. Spirit come, Spirit come. Come on, lift it up. What you spoke is now unfolding. Yeah. All your children shall be holy. Dreams awaken in this moment. Spirit come, Spirit come. Pour it out. Let your love run. Your glory fill this house, pour it out, let your love run over, here and now, let your glory fill this house. Now the world awaits your presence. This power is within us. We will rise to be your witness. Spirit come, Spirit come. Pour it out. Let your love run
Until you burn me <laughs> For our King is soon returning As we hold to this assurance today. Father, we worship you. We've come to worship you, Father. Spirit, come. We wait on you, Lord. Yes, we wait on you, Lord. I don't know what you've come in with this morning, but you need to surrender. Surrender it all.
to Jesus. We surrender to your Father. We surrender to your Father. Just let him love on you today. Oh, surrender. Like a rushing wind, Jesus, breathe within. Lord, have your way. Lord, away from him. If you need to sit and close your eyes and just talk to the Lord, or if you need to stand and prostrate yourself and surrender to him, just lift your hands and surrender. To you. I want to know 
one word, you calm every storm. With just one word, you bring lost people unto you. Oh, we thank you. Pray him. Pray to him. Thank him. Thank him that we get to gather freely. For the first time in our lives, we've stopped, really stopped. The everyday, the normal, and even the mundane have all been redefined. We were working, going to school, buying groceries, hanging out with friends, going to practice, hosting dinner parties, going out on dates, and taking the kids to the park. Now we are seeing life through FaceTime and Zoom calls binge watching every series available, looking up and realizing that the sun still comes out every morning and that the world keeps spinning even though we stopped. But we won't be still forever. When the time comes, we won't be afraid to step outside and begin again. We'll look forward to coffee breaks with coworkers. We'll spend summer break waiting to see campus again. We'll try new recipes with friends. We will hug and shake hands instead of wave and never let a sunny day go to waste again. So get ready to hit the play button because the time is coming. We thought we knew what living free and fully alive was before, but even that has changed. We will emerge from isolation, a better community, and never go back to the way it was. For the first time in our lives, we will live. Really live. You know, guys, this has been an interesting and unique season, but we will survive. We absolutely will. And I'm so proud of you and how faithful you've been during this season. It's been amazing that early on at the beginning of the pandemic, when we weren't even having services here in person, but we were continuing our digital stream, we were feeding school children who weren't able to go to school. We were feeding people in communities where groceries are hard to come by. And you guys were doing that. You were giving, but you were also not just giving money, but you were giving your time. You helped with tornado relief and all sorts of things. And I'm just so, so proud of you. I wanna tell you this morning as we, as we start our offering time that this is a moment of worship. When you give, it is truly worship unto the Lord. And there's several ways that you can do that. If you're here in the auditorium today, you can give at one of the buckets that are placed around the auditorium for a touch-free way that you can give. You also can give at one of our kiosks or you can give online at our website, obvishouse.com in the Ibis House app, or you can text to give. We try to make that as simple for you as possible. Just so you can know what some of your offerings and gifts have done recently, just in the last couple of weeks, we have done the Backpack Project in a different way. This is a project we've done for almost 20 years to help families in our community who need school supplies. This year, because of the pandemic, we did a drive through backpack giveaway right here in front of our church, and many families came by to pick those up on their way home. 
but we also have given some additional ones to Middle Valley Elementary School, a, a group called Building Stable Families, Sukasa, CW Kids, CLP Udawa, and Wolf Teaver Creek Elementary School. So thank you so much. Your generous gifts have made that possible, that kids, whether they're going to school in person or whether do, they're doing school online or whether they're being homeschooled, they have the supplies that they need. We do have a few of those left. If you know of a family that has a need for school supplies, please call 423-877-6462 and let us know because we want to get those supplies into the hands of the kids who need them. God is good all the time. He's good in pandemics. He's good when finances are tight. He's even good when you're struggling in your marriage or you've had a death in your family. He's good all the time. In fact, we're most like him when we give. He gave it all. He gave his life and he even gave himself in death. Let's pray. Jesus, as we walk through life, we want to be more like you. We want to learn from you. We want to learn from your ways. We want to learn from the way that you talked and the way that you interacted with people. And we want to be more like that. And Jesus, we know that you were a generous person. You were generous with your time with people. You were generous with the things that you had. You were generous with the gifts that were within you. You were generous with your life. God, work in our hearts. It's easy to just look at all the things swirling around us, even in this season. But God, help us to search our hearts and see where we are with you today. Help us to give so that other lives can be changed and that other people can know what it really means to live free and fully alive. God, I thank you for our church. I thank you for their faithfulness. And God, I speak continued favor over the families that are sitting before me and the families that will watch online. God, I ask that you would continue to bless them. God, I ask that, that jobs that may have been tough in this season, God, or jobs that they're unsure if they're going to still be there in a few weeks or a few months, God, that you would open new doors or that you would bring increase where they are, unexpected increase, and that you would bless them. God, just as you spoke a blessing over Abraham, a man of faith. God, I speak a blessing over these people today that you would increase their faith in this season. God, I thank you for everything you are to us. In Jesus' name, amen.
small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all jesus paid it all all to him my own sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus Jesus paid it all all to him my own sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow The crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Oh, he washed it white as snow. Yes, he did. Oh, oh praise the one who made my dead and raised his life up from the dead.
Pastor Ronnie, and I add my welcome to all of that. Uh, and I'm uh, grateful that we are back online right now. So let's welcome our online audience. There was an outage in our region, and uh, we're back up and running. And so we welcome everyone watching online, and I welcome all of you into Abba's house this morning, a house of grace. Good to be with you this morning. I tell you what, uh, if you missed worship and you're just now tuning in online, I pray that you'll watch uh, the restream of that later. It was powerful, wasn't it? Powerful. I felt the anointing and just tears started to run down my face, especially during how great thou art. My goodness. I tell you, we're going through some difficult times, aren't we? But there's going to come a day where we see Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day. And my spirit will sing how great thou art. I'm telling you, we've never seen anything like it, but it's going to be powerful. My grandfather, when the, he died, the day he died, the last song he ever listened to, on the way to meet some deacons at a Hardy's to talk about who they were going to visit that week, he was listening to how great thou art, and uh, he died of heart failure later that day. So that song... <laughs> grips me for a number of reasons. He lived a very hard life, like many of you, abandoned as a child and was an alcoholic many years, but found Jesus and spent his last days on earth serving God and telling people about Jesus and was a deacon at his church and uh, can't wait to see him. Amen. How many of you have lost someone this past year that you loved? Many of you, it's been a tough year, but I'm telling you, we're going to see them again. Amen. And there'll be a glorious reunion in the heavens. And I'm so looking forward to that day. Well, let's get into the word of God this morning. We've been in a series titled, I Will, and we've been speaking faith in this season. We're speaking our way out of this season by faith. Amen. We're making declarations. And we're going to make another one today. And uh, I believe this with all of my heart, and I want you to believe it with me. And the title of my message this morning is, I Will Survive. Say that with me. I will survive. I thought about starting with a little Bocephus this morning. The preacher man says, it's the end of time, and the Mississippi River, she's a going dry. But I'm not going to do that. And if you got that, we can be friends later, okay? If you, if you know what I'm talking about, hallelujah. But we will survive as a kingdom. We will survive as a church. We will survive as a family. We will survive as a nation. I believe that with all of my heart, and I want you to grab hold of that with me. But I want to talk to you about Job this morning. 42 chapters. I'm not going to cover all of those this morning, so don't get nervous. Uh, 42 chapters that describes nine months of loss and 360 days of a journey. I think it's significant that we're about to enter into the ninth month of this extremely difficult year, and many theologians believe that Job suffered loss for nine months, and then the next two and a half to three months was his turnaround. I believe prophetically we're about to turn around. Amen. <laughs> Statistics are going down. Favors going up. I believe that 100% with all of my heart. Job is the oldest book in the Bible, but he wasn't the oldest man in the Bible. Job, uh, literally, the story there is older than Moses, literally. Uh, and it was before Israel was a nation because Israel came from the loins and the life of Abraham. So this is a very old book, and it was used oftentimes to describe faith and even creation. There are some strange things in this book. If you think about the time in which it was written, when it talks about our earth being hung from nothing. You think of the Milky Way and the galaxies out there. How did they know that? Because God divinely inspired his writings, amen? They knew that. They even talked about how iron in the, in the book of Job comes from the earth and how uh, fossil fuel comes from earth. How, uh, this old manuscript, they knew things that science hadn't even caught up with yet. 
They said a man would be known by his hands, fingerprints, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. I tell you, God's word is inerrant, my friend. It is infallible. It is true. It is the word of God. It is not allegorical. It's biblical, spiritual, and it is undeniable. Amen. God's word still speaks. It is still true. And as long as I'm preaching, we're going to preach from God's word. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But Job was from a place called Uz. It was east of Canaan. It was kind of a poor region near the desert, near a dry place. His family wasn't wealthy when he was a youngster, but somehow God took him from obscurity to prosperity, from the dry place into a place of wealth and prosperity. Let me say this. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what your family did. If you will fixate your eyes on Jesus, he will take you places you've never been before. God can make something out of nothing and he can rewrite the destiny of your family. Amen. God can take you from nowhere to somewhere. Amen. From the outhouse to the penthouse. And Job became a very wealthy man. But it says in Job chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, that he was blameless, that he was upright, that he feared God and that he hated evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. But God and the devil decided to have a conversation about Job. Have you ever felt like you were trying to have a conversation with God, but he wasn't listening? I tell you, could you imagine how Job felt? He's upright, he's blameless, he loves God, he's put his faith and trust in God, he's living right, and in this dispensation, he's just like a born-again, blood-bought believer. That's what he would have been like. He's living for God and Somehow communication stops because God's talking to the devil. Imagine that. And basically, to paraphrase, the devil says to God, listen, this Job, he, he only serves you and gives you the praise because of his wealth and because of his prosperity and because of his family. If, if he didn't have all of those things, he would not serve you. He would not worship you. He's in it for the money. If he didn't have all of that, he wouldn't be as blameless and as upright. And so God permits the devil to attack Job, to take from him. And it was something fierce. Tornado kills this family. His livestock is gone. Everything around him taken, destroyed, death. His own wife said, curse God and die. Which can almost be translated in the Hebrew is, because you've blessed God, you're going to die. Give up. But he wouldn't. The enemy always attacks what it fears. The enemy always attacks what it fears. The enemy fears authentic faith. The enemy fears faithfulness. The enemy fears a sold-out Christian. The enemy fears a blood-bought church. The enemy fears a blameless young person living for Jesus. So the enemy attacks what he fears. You may say, Pastor Ronnie, I've been through hell in a handbasket. Things have happened to me I didn't deserve. The enemy is threatened by your anointing. The enemy has tried to kill you or your children because God's got an anointing on their life. And he fights what he fears. He violates what God values. The devil has come to kill, steal, and destroy. He seeks to do that in your life. And in the kingdom, the enemy hated Job because he feared Job. We learn about Satan in this ancient text. 
that he has access to both heaven and earth, that he roams like a lion and he roars like a lion, but he's on God's leash. Amen. And he can't do anything unless God permits it. And in this case, God permitted it. Because while Satan hated Job, God loved and trusted Job. Because God wasn't going to lose the argument to Satan. And who better to put the pressure on than this blameless, upright, and faithful man? You wonder why you've been going through so much because God knows you're going to get the victory. God knows you're going to come out of this better. And God knows he can count on you to stand when no one else will. The enemy can also be a hitman for God. When people are away from God or dishonoring his church or his kingdom or grieving the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, it says, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. So yes, sometimes Satan, as foolish as he is, will actually, by attacking you, be fulfilling the providence and the plan of God. And you'll clean up, and you'll stand up, and you'll become who God's called you to be. And this fool Satan doesn't even understand he's playing a role in the kingdom because he's already been defeated. He's just an agitator and an aggravator. He's been defeated by the blood of Jesus Christ. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Delivered to Satan to teach them a lesson. If God can't get your attention, then things will begin to happen to you until you submit to the process that God has for you. Satan is a tempter. He is a sifter. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's a murderer. He is the father of all lies, but he's been defeated. God shut Satan's mouth for 1,400 years, took his power, and defeated him. So we don't need to walk around like we've lost the battle because we have the victory in Jesus Christ. I don't care what they've diagnosed you with, what they've said about you. I don't care if they've given up on you. You have the victory through the blood. If you know Jesus, you're a winner. It's already settled. You have the victory. Job's wife, as I said, said, curse God and die. But he wouldn't. He said, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. You're a fool. Shall we indeed accept good? from God and shall we not accept adversity in all this the Bible says Job did not sin with his lips so first let's talk about the struggles of Job the struggles of Job I do believe he struggled with frustration in this season he felt like God couldn't hear him he questioned what was happening to him he he struggled with frustration Self-righteousness. Because sometimes, not only can you struggle with frustration, but when you have it all, or at least more than most, you can get to a place where you think it's because of your gift, or because of your hard work, or because of your anointing. It's all because of Jesus. And the moment when you take the credit for something only God can do, you are setting yourself up for failure. Self-righteousness. He also had the wrong friends. 
I tell you, there's nothing worse than going through a dry season or suffering loss with the wrong kinds of friends that give you the wrong kinds of advice. First thing they did, it says, is they just didn't say a word to him. They ignored him, and then when they did talk, they had negative things to say. See, some of you have got people in your life that you need to get rid of. They don't build you up. They don't believe in you. They, they don't do anything but suck the life out of you. And when you need them, they curse you instead of helping you. Elahaz was the first friend. We're going to call him Elahaz the Pentecostal. The Pentecostal. What'd he say? You have sinned. You're going through this, Job, because you're a no good, low down sinner. You deserve this. If you were as spiritual as me, you wouldn't be going through losing your family to death and losing your wealth and boils popping up all over your body and sickness if you weren't such a sinner. Then we're going to talk about Bildad the Baptist. Bildad the Baptist, you were full of hot air. I mean, it's just supposed to be his friend. I mean, he's lost everything. And, and, and this guy says, you're full of hot air. You're a fake. You're a fraud. You're a blowhard. And then we're going to talk about Zophar the Calvinist. You mock God. Your life is a fairy tale. You mock God, Job. You mock God. And then the Baptist chimes in and tells him to shut up. Eliphaz says, the Pentecostal says, you're wicked. You're a dirty man. And then Bildad the Baptist says, you were a maggot. Because Baptists cuss a little more than Pentecostals. Say a little bit worse language. You see, we got to learn sometimes when people are going through things, we, we don't need to say anything. And if we are going to say something, it needs to be encouraging and comforting. I, I never forget when I, I first got into the ministry, I had someone tell me that loved me as I was going through seminary and learning pastoral care. And they said, whenever someone dies and you go on a visit to their house, this is not the time to be doctrinal. It's not the time to say, hey, this is God's plan. Because a six-year-old that just lost their dad is not going to understand that. They're going to hear that as God just took my dad. And you become a hindrance trying to be doctrinal and spiritual during someone else's tragedy or crisis. And it... At times, Christians, we need to understand, sometimes a hug or a word of encouragement is all God wants us to say. Not to be everybody's spiritual judge during their difficult seasons. Learn to be silent in the face of tragedy. Job 13, verse 5 says, Oh, that you would be silent. Oh, that you would be silent. And it would be your wisdom. There's wisdom in silence. Job's struggles and trials were so bad, he wished he hadn't even been born. Oh, but God was not punishing Job. God was proving Job. God's not punishing you. He's proving you. And when you come out on the other side of this my goodness you're going to be walking with some favor and some anointing and with an angelic covering that can't be explained the struggles of Job number two the strategy of Satan as I said it's to still kill and destroy but it's always to disprove God to discredit God and to disrespect God and this whole thing was about Disproving God, disrespecting God, and discrediting God. But it didn't work. Job 
would say, and we'll come back to this throughout the message, naked I came in this world, and naked I leave, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, I lost my family member, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, they diagnosed me with cancer, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, I buried my friend. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, he left me, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, she left me, but blessed be the name of the Lord. They laid me off and didn't give me my pension, but blessed be the name of the Lord. They closed my business down during a pandemic, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, you've got to learn how to get a hold of a God that never fails, that loves you unconditionally during these difficult times. You've got to learn that he's more than just words on a page. He is spirit and he's truth and he's ever present. And if you call on the name that is above every name, he will come. and He will answer you. Oh, yeah, there's a strategy. But Satan's been defeated. By the blood of Jesus, he's already lost. Some things we learn from this ancient text. First is that life's not fair. Life's not fair. This season is not fair. I don't know of anyone that's not struggled or that is not struggling during this season. Business owners, pastors, leaders, friends, church family members. Many are struggling, many are hurting. And it's not just because of this virus, it's because of everything else that's happened this year. Some, some of the things people are dealing with, God's people, don't even have anything to, anything to do with this pandemic. It's just been that kind of year. But we're entering into a season of restoration and change. I'm believing that by faith. I need you to believe it with me. Life is not fair. I um, spoke with a pastor friend of mine at a Baptist church. I'm burdened for him. I'll get through it. Him and his wife couldn't have children, so they adopted two kids. One's from Africa, African-American young boy. Precious young boy. And after the George Floyd incident, my pastor friend, who is a biblical conservative, simply posted on social media that he worried for his son. And he was called in to a meeting this past week, and they accused him of supporting a terrorist organization and all kinds of craziness and he's probably about to lose his church. What a shame. What a shame that God's people can't see past their own political nonsense and find the kingdom and can't just see a dad that cares about his son. fed up with it. I see the devil all over it. I long for peace and unity and the church to be the kingdom of God. I believe it can be. But I was reminded after hearing the cries of this pastor that life is not fair. The enemy knows our weaknesses. He wants to expose our weaknesses. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We cannot in this moment live in fear any longer. If you read this ancient text, Job lived in fear of losing it all. And he lost it all. Sometimes fear brings on negative outcomes in our lives. Anxiety, constantly worrying about losing a loved one or losing what you've got or are we going to make it? 
These are normal things that we all deal with as adults and as Christians. But I'm telling you, if it gets to a place where it consumes your thoughts day in and day out, friend, you will bring on negativity in your life. Job 3, 25 says, For the thing I greatly fear has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. The thing I greatly feared, the thing I dreaded has happened. We've got to be delivered of that spirit of fear. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I believe the sound mind also equals common sense. We're to have wisdom in how we live, but all I'm telling you, if you are scared 24 hours a day, friend, you need deliverance. Worst thing they can do to me is kill me. Then I get to see Jesus. Amen. Satan has a failed strategy. The other thing I see in this ancient text is that Job was comfortable with where he was. We've been in this dispensation of grace as a kingdom, and if you don't understand dispensations, we'll do that on a Wednesday night sometime. But basically, God's been very good to the Christian church for a number of years. And that season is coming to an end. And it's my prayer that we haven't been too comfortable. It's my prayer that we haven't just enjoyed the wealth and the benefits of God's kingdom without paying a price for it. Because if that's the case, we will answer for it. I'm telling you, God's people have to be God's people. Biblical, even if it offends the group you associate with. Biblical if it offends my political party. Biblical if it offends my peer group. Biblical. Biblical. Let's talk quickly. We move from the strategy to the significance of Job's faith in crisis. What I love about Job is he worshiped in crisis. The Bible says, put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. He worshiped God in the midst of a crisis. Oh, how many of you, if you buried your child, would say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know if I could get it out. Oh, but I'm telling you, you know you're walking with God when no matter what kind of blow the devil delivers you, you find a way to worship God anyways. No matter what they say about you, you're going to worship God anyways. No matter what you've lost, you're going to worship God anyways. Somebody give God a shout of worship. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be your name. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head like me. He had good taste. Fell to the ground and worshiped. Oh, my goodness. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gives, and the Lord taketh away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. He worshiped God in a crisis. Next, he refused to turn his back on God. He refused to turn his back on God. He refused. How much would it take for you to turn your back on Jesus? Would it be a gun to the face? Would it be a terrorist that threatened to cut your children's head off? Would it be a better job or more money that would cause you to turn your back on your faith? Or the risk of losing it all? He wouldn't turn his back on God. Next, he longed for the Spirit of God. Listen to this, Job chapter 9, verse 32. I love this. I've never heard it preached before. He says, God is not a mortal like me. There's something different about you, God. There's something spiritual. You got to understand how long ago this was. Jesus hadn't been born. Pentecost hadn't happened. Israel wasn't a nation. But he says, there's, it's not, you're not a mortal like me. There's something different about you, God. There's something spiritual about you. So I cannot argue with him or take him to trial. If only 
there were a mediator between us. My goodness. Hebrews, he is the mediator of the new covenant. Oh, there is a mediator. and There was coming a mediator. His name was Jesus. Oh, but there was an Elihu in this story too. We talked about his religious friends. There was also a friend that steered him back to righteousness. That's a picture of Jesus Christ in this story. Yeah, you may have bad voices in your life, friend, but I promise you there's one saying, live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. My goodness. Lord, teach us to the, listen to the right voice. Teach us to listen to your voice. He longed for the Spirit. Oh, my goodness. Next, he got his breakthrough. Job 19, verse 23. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. And they were. That they were engraved on a rock. And they were. With an iron pen and lead forever. For I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. And he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold and not another. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. Oh, he longed for the Spirit and he got his breakthrough. He got his breakthrough. Now, what I believe we're about to enter into in the next four months, the success of his restoration. The success of his restoration. He had to make his mind up to survive. And not only to survive, to thrive. Not only to survive, but long for the spirit. Friend, No matter what you were going through, and we're all going through different things, you've got to dig your feet in and say, I was built for this. I will survive this. I will not turn my back on God. I will trust God. My Redeemer lives. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I will worship God no matter what comes my way. My, my, my. I tell you, there is a success story hidden here you see everybody talks about the trials of Job but they don't talk about the triumph of Job he recovered it all my friend he recovered it all he said in Job 23 verse 10 he said when he has tested me I shall come forth as gold I like that gold represented the finer things purity an unbreakable metal He says, listen, when I get through this, I'm coming out like gold. Somebody need to hit somebody or air five them and say, you're coming out like gold. Hallelujah. We're coming out of this. We're going to survive this. And we're going to shine like that city set up on a hill. We're going to sparkle like gold. The kingdom's going to sparkle. Those of us that have his light on the inside of us. He went from 7,000 sheep that he lost to 14,000 sheep, 3,000 to 6,000, 500 to 1,000 oxen, 500 female donkeys to 1,000. He lost his sons, but God gave him seven more. So that's 14. You say, how's that 14? He had seven in heaven. Went from seven to 14, went from three to six daughters. Somebody say double portion. Job also lived to be 140. 140. The average life expectancy back then was 70. Biblically, that's what was promised, 70 years. He doubled it. Somebody say, I'm about to double it. I believe with all of my heart, a double portion is coming for God's kingdom kids. His kingdom children the ones who refuse to turn their back on him or his word, there is a double portion coming. Successful people move on. We talked about the success of his restoration. Successful people move on. They don't stay in the past. They know how to wash their face and have another baby. It's not that you don't care about that person you lost or the difficulties you went through. 
It's not that you don't use them as a launching pad or a reference point, but you cannot stay back there. As long as you're on earth, you have purpose and you have to advance God's kingdom and you cannot do that staying back there. You have to move forward. Successful people move on. Another thing I've learned about successful people is that successful people focus on others. You want to find your joy again in a pandemic? Serve somebody else. Love somebody else. Don't make it about you. Job 42 verse 10, and the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Twice as much because it wasn't about him, it was about others. Successful people move on, but successful people focus on others. And finally, successful people survive seasons that killed others. How? Because they have a redeemer on the inside of them that is undefeated, unblemished, untarnished, never failed. Died on the cross, got up out of the grave on the third day victorious, left the Holy Spirit and a promise not to leave us orphans, and he's coming back for God's people. I will survive. You will survive. We win. We win. We will survive this. And we're entering into a double portion. You remember I said that. And watch what God does. Hallelujah. Listen, if you're watching or you're in here and you don't know Jesus Christ, this Redeemer we speak of, born of a virgin, fulfilled every Hebrew promise, never sinned, died on a cross, took our place on that cross so that we might live free and fully alive. That same Redeemer has guaranteed us an eternity in heaven if we put our faith and trust in Him and also given us a kingdom that cannot be shaken. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I want to lead you in a prayer from the book of Romans that will help you make Him the Lord of your life. Would everybody bow your head and close your eyes with me in the house? If you're watching online, whether it's this morning or this evening or Tuesday morning, whenever it is, it's just as relevant whenever you're watching. If you need Jesus Christ in your life, I just want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Please come into my heart and save me. That's right. Lord, please come into my heart and save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And use me for your glory. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it. I need you when you can to email me at prayer at abbishouse.com. Do it now. Email me your name and a way to contact you. Phone number, address. We'll send you some things to help you get started. But for many of you in the house today I want to deal with that before we go back into worship if you need prayer I'm going to be bold in here if you need prayer right now would you just stand on your feet for strength to survive if you need prayer I want to know who I'm praying for in the house for strength in this pandemic many of you if you're at home you can join in with this too but this is primarily for the people I see right now just hold your hands up would you Holy Spirit's big enough to minister to you from right where you are and me right here Heavenly Father send your comforter to these people that are hurting send them supernatural strength to worship you in this season give them strength not to turn their back on you or your word May your fire fall on them and relaunch them and rejuvenate them for the journey ahead. Lord, heal them. If there's anything broken in their life emotionally, physically, heal them right now through the power of your Holy Spirit. I declare those of you struggling will enter into a season of multiplication. You will come out of this 
stronger, better, blameless and upright. And you will receive double what you lost. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, just minister to them. For the rest of you, would you stand on your feet and just begin to magnify the Lord and praise God and worship Him in this season. Pray for those of your peers you saw standing. Pray for them. Pray for your family. Pray for our city. Pray for our church. Pray for our nation. Just begin to pray. Enter into a time of praying and magnifying the Lord. Jesus, King of Kings. Lord, we lift up our praises to you today, our gratitude, our hearts. Lord, we're nothing without you. Naked we came in this world, naked we'll leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We trust you in this season, Father. Thank you for dying for us, for saving us, for loving us when we don't deserve it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are worthy to be praised. We are willing to learn in this season, to love in this season, to live by faith and not by fear. We decree it and we declare it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you magnify the Lord, let's worship together, can we? Oh, praise the Lord who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. That was a powerful message. Thank you, Pastor Ronnie, for helping us maneuver these waters of how to survive during such difficult times. Now, guys, I got a special announcement. Next Sunday, Pastor Ron will be preaching. He's going to join in on this series. And the title of his message is going to be, I Will Not Hold Back. You know it's going to be powerful. But you know what? Before next Sunday, Wednesday, Midweek Momentum, guess who's going to be joining us? Pastor Ron will be joining us, and his message is entitled, Not Deceived. It's going to be a powerful, powerful week, and we all want to absorb what Pastor Ron has for us. Now, guys, Freedom Rally is just around the corner. It's like a couple of weeks away. We're going to have Lionel Blair. We're going to have Damon Thompson, Pastor Ronnie, of course, and, and Pastor Ron. You don't want to miss out. And so for our online campus and for our Hickson campus, you guys register. Go to the website and let us know you're coming so that we can take care of you. We can fill you in on all the details. Register right away. It's going to be an amazing time. And lastly, guys, don't forget, if you need prayer, email the church. We want to connect with you and we want to pray for you. Guys, again, thank you so much for being a part of today's online campus. We love you and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.